Hello, Pagan Pages readers. Robin Fennelly here, and this month I've decided to do my Magical Arts column as a video. I thought that was rather appropriate given the COVID-19 crisis and all of the ways in which we're trying to connect and reach out to one another. So I thought perhaps this month it might be kind of nice to have a personal one-on-one -on face-to-face as I talk you through uh, what I'm going to be writing about this month. So as you know, with the Magical Arts column, I've been talking quite a bit about the creation of sacred space, what that means. So this month, what I thought I would kind of segue into is part one of ritual writing and the creation of sacred space. Generally, when we think about sacred space, we often automatically go to the thought about using that term in regards to a ritual that we were writing or attending or something that we've been to. Hopefully by now, if you've read my other month's articles, you know that sacred space is much, much more than that. But because ritual is such an integral part of the creation of sacred space, I thought that it would be nice for these next two months to focus a little bit more on what you would be thinking about, uh, the components of and, and the nuances of actually writing your own rituals and making them full and rich and really an imprint, an energetic imprint of who you are as a witch and as a magical worker. So that's what we're going to do for uh, this month's work. So I'm going to switch uh, my screen now and I'm going to share with you a PowerPoint da, 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 uh, presentation that I put together for this work that we're going to talk about. And we're going to start from the very beginning of what is going to be a two-part series. So, ritual writing and the creation of sacred space. And this is, of course, for the June 2020 paganpages.org. First thing, what is ritual? Now, these are just my definitions of what I would consider ritual to be. I would encourage you to create your own definitions. So here's the disclaimer here that I throw out there and I teach quite a bit, I write quite a bit, and I always throw out this disclaimer for students or for anyone that I interact with. Always remember that anything you read, anything that you attend by way of a course or a class is always going to be filtered through the lens of the individual who's giving you that information. What that means more specifically is, no matter how esteemed that teacher or that author may be, or how much you feel that they absolutely 100% know their stuff, it really is your responsibility to make sure that what you take away from that is in alignment and is in resonance with who you are personally. So that means that sometimes you're going to come across some things that you may kind of scratch your head at, you may not quite know what to make of what the individual has said, and hopefully you won't fall into the, the thought process of, oh, well, they know so much more than I do, so this must be true. This must be true for them. That doesn't mean that just because you perceive the individual as having more knowledge than yourself, that they know what is right for you. So that's the disclaimer that I'm throwing out to you. And this goes for all of the reading that you do as well. Books are wonderful. I love books. Um, I love to take classes. I love to do workshops. I love to teach. But I have to really be intelligent and have a discernment about what I choose to bring into my own practice. And that also means that you also have to have an open perspective, an open mind. So I don't want you to shut down completely and become rigid in your own beliefs. Have an open mind. Take the information in, chew up on it for a little bit, and then make your own decision about how much and how you know well that aligns with what you believe. And never say never, because I will tell you that there have been so many times that 
I've either gone into a bookstore and not known why I purchased a particular book because it had nothing to do with anything that I currently even thought I was remotely interested in, or I went to a lecture or I heard something and I just kind of tucked it away. And then maybe two years, two months, 20 years later, all of a sudden it was exactly the right book. It was exactly the right content. It was exactly what I needed. So don't say never about something. Keep an open mind about things, but be fully aware of what it is that resonates with you at any given time. So that was a very long disclaimer, but this is really important because I'm setting the tone with giving you my definition of what is ritual. I say it is everything and anything that is repetitive in action, albeit not necessarily identical in practice. Now, these things relate to both your mundane and your spiritual, because guys, let's face it, one of the big things we say is that we are on our path practicing 365, 24-7, that we are not just a Sunday, get dressed up, go to church, have your blessed day then. We live what it is we believe, and we act in accord and harmony with those beliefs and philosophies. So if you take it from that perspective, then I say that everything and anything that is repetitive in its action, meaning that it continues to call to you, albeit not necessarily identical in practice, any action or thought that has a specific intention and desired outcome or source of flow from that intention. So ritual is any action that we have, that we act upon, that is infused with intention. So spell crafting is actually a form of ritual. It may not look the same as when you go to a lovely celebratory sabbat, but it is a ritual after all. And an intention that becomes the sacred work of spirit and flows through the small will, the higher will, of manifest being, and that is us. So any intention that we then take to become our sacred work, become the sacred work of our higher selves, and throw, flows through that process of desire and passion, which is the will, through the manifest being that we are, is ritual as well. So you could say that we embody ritual. And if we broaden our definition of ritual to be inc more inclusive of these things, we see that something such as our morning routine to prepare for the day's activities is a ritual. The favorite place we go for lunch or dinner and return to routine routinely is ritual. And the way we greet our friends, lover, children, and companions is ritual. Everything we do is ritual. So what are the building blocks of a ritual? And I've used here the model of the five alchemical elements because they flow through everything. They are part and parcel of everything, including our own being. So first building block of a, of a ritual is earth. This is forming the intention. When we form an intention, we are actually set, setting out into the universe a message that says, I'm ready for something to happen. I am ready for something to occur. I am sending you a message and I am expecting that there will be a follow through in reciprocity so that a circuit can begin. And that circuit that begins is what sets up the magic. That is the magic. So the earth component here is the forming of that intention. You could think of it as being the blueprint for what your ritual is going to be. Some questions that you might want to consider as you're forming this earthly intention. What is my purpose? And what is the theme? So when we go about writing a ritual, these Two questions will set the course of action for what happens afterwards. Having in your bag of tricks the foundation from which to build upon is necessary, but the foundation is only going to be as good as how you make the identification for that 
foundation of what the purpose of it is. Just building, you know, a beautiful patio is wonderful, but if you don't intend it for something, it just remains an unused, beautiful patio. And moreover, is there a theme? So when we're thinking about the purpose of what our ritual is going to be, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a few moments, then we also want to think, what is the theme that we want to carry through? Because as we also know, you can find multiple correspondences for everything and anything. And if you are still with me in the thought process that everything is ritual within our lives, then that even opens it up wider in terms of what the theme is. What's the theme of your day? How does your day start? What's the theme of the dinner that you're going to lovingly prepare for your family? So questions to consider from forming that intention and that will also help to form it are what is my purpose and what is the theme? If we move to the aspect of air, this is where we find the blueprint and the structure, meaning that air is thought and mind and the ability to codify, bring into some sort of structure what earth has created as our foundation, meaning that you have all the bricks, you have all of the materials, you have the purpose, you have the theme. So now we're going to shift those things around kind of like a puzzle and see what it is and where things make sense and how the theme that I have set for this, the overarching theme, how can I use all of the tools that are at my disposal in terms of the earthly realm of intention and put it into something that is going to be much more doable. Some questions to consider for this. What components are necessary? What is the desired flow of the ritual? And where are the highlights? So with these questions, we're narrowing it down. What components do we need? So if my purpose for this ritual is, let's say it's a healing ritual that we want to do. And my theme, I've already formulated the intention for that healing ritual, is that I am going to make use of the water's energy. So now I need to consider, well, what components would be necessary for a healing ritual that incorporates a watery theme? Maybe some components that I would like to have would actually be something that can contain water, whether it be a chalice or a cauldron or a beautiful bowl. Maybe I actually want to put water in it. Maybe I want purified water because for healing, I want everything that is going to be um, pure and, and vibrant and strong and flowing well. What is the desired flow of the ritual? So am I going to use the healing waters in my cauldron in the beginning of the ritual? Or do I want to do something that's going to lead up to that? Maybe I want to do something that is going to help me release and shake loose those parts of myself that I feel need healing. And I'll do that before I actually use the water, the purified charged water in the beautiful bowl. And where are the highlights? So is the highlight going to be that working, that we're considering the renewal of ourselves in using those waters in some way? Or is the highlight going to actually be in shaking up all of those pieces and the water and the bowl are gonna be the recipient of that, but they're not gonna be the major focus. And what will provide consistency? So, as I'm putting these things together, how can I make this ritual such that it will flow consistently? Meaning that if I'm going to do a healing ritual using water, I'm not in the middle of it suddenly going to shift to burning all of the words of, of um, my ailments and my, and my disparity in a cauldron with fire and flame. If my intention is to use the soothing process of water. So we come to water, but water in any of the rituals 
we're going to use to fuel the desired outcome. That doesn't necessarily mean physical water. Water, if we remember, also represents those intuitive depths, that ability to open our inner sight, that ability to use this third eye to see. And when, we, when I say see, I'm talking about to see the vision of what is going on etherically, ephemerally, and being able to also see the vision of what the outcome can be. So in order to fuel what the work is with this healing ritual, I need to be able to actually do something. I need to actually, even though we think of fire as an action, water is an action as well. Water gives the necessary movement. If we think about waters, oceans, seas, anything like that, water flows, water moves, it clears away, it can rise up in, in turbulence as a storm, it can be a tsunami that completely wipes everything out, or it can just be a gentle current that carries along the leaves that have fallen from the trees nearby. So some questions to consider for the water element that is held in whatever type of ritual you do. What actions are relevant for this? So if I'm doing a healing watery ritual, I may not want to include an action that is going to tax me uh, energetically. I'm not going to include an element where I'm raising huge amounts of energy and huge amounts of power, because quite frankly, if I'm calling healing into myself, I want to perhaps do an action that is going to call that energy into me and then breathe it out into all the parts of my being so that they can be, the thirst can be quenched. You can think of it that way. What methods are most effective? So how are we going to accomplish whatever that particular thing may be? So going back to this ritual that we're kind of constructing, we decided to use a water element. We decided that one of the highlights is going to be stirring up within ourselves um, those things that we wish to heal within ourselves. Then we're going to use a cauldron or a bowl that contains the healing waters necessary. So maybe an action and a method and something again that will provide the consistency. Perhaps what we would want to do for that is, as we are calling up within ourselves all of these things that are disparate and that uh, are making us feel less than whole, Perhaps we want to take our bowl or chalice of water that we've prepared, and as we call these things up, we want to breathe each of those items into this water. So if I'm feeling as though um, I am weak in my constitution, and I just feel as though I barely am able to get up in the morning, then I will call that up. I will fuel it with the action of breathing that intention out. I will give it a crystalline structure and I will breathe it into those waters. That might be the method that I use versus writing it down on a piece of paper and then placing it in the water uh, that, that you have prepared and then actually a, and I mean a very tiny piece of, of paper, and then you would want to possibly pour that water into a, a fast moving stream. I'm not suggesting that you litter here. Like I said, a very tiny, tiny piece of paper that can be carried along in a body of water that's large enough that it would not impact anything. And then finally, fire. Fire constitutes the actions the vibration and the rhythm of that particular ri ritual. So questions to consider are, how will I raise energy? Now this is a healing ritual. I'm not saying you don't wanna raise energy at all. I'm saying that you don't wanna deplete yourself if you are feeling less than capable. And what layers should be created? So when we think about fire, actions, vibration, and rhythm, perhaps at the end of this ritual, after we've poured everything into the waters, then what we would do is we would call in the energy of the universe. We would call into a healing deity if we wished. We would call into all of the healing and positive natures that we are aligned with and resonate with. We would pour that into this bowl that contains all of those things that we have released from ourselves. 
we would hold the intention of the fires of action and will changing it transforming it you may wish to tone some ohms into the water you may wish to use your favorite chant chanting over the water you may wish to use a singing bowl near the water or a drum whatever you feel comfortable with or just simply make sounds tones whatever you feel needs needs to be done in that very action itself you're raising energy anytime we move we are actually raising energy so raising that energy letting whatever it is dissipate letting the healing come into your being and then i would probably finish as my last action a toning of ohm the ohm would act as a vibration of reciprocity, meaning that I am connecting my energy to the energy of the cosmos. And by opening that conduit and that channel, things are able to flow through me to renew me, to reach into all the layers of my subtle being and to make me whole. And then finally, spirit rising on the planes as the higher self is engaged. So if you are doing your ritual with intention and purpose and you have thought it out automatically your spirit will be engaged automatically you will be rising on the planes automatically you will be in communion with your higher nature which is in communion with everything else that is going on around you in this process so some questions to consider for this is what will happen how will it feel and what change will it make now there are times in ritual that we actually want to make this piece absolutely the highlight of it and in that case you have to consider how is this going to happen? What's going to happen? We don't want to overtax individuals who are participating in this, and we don't want to overtax ourselves, if it's a solitary ritual, in perhaps working in an energetic way that we're not accustomed to. How will it feel? So especially if this is a ritual that's for a group, having an idea yourself as far as you having practiced whatever method or technique you've chosen can give you a little bit of a of an inkling as to how it will feel in general and what change will it make you never want to just simply raise energy for the sake of raising energy i mean it's okay to do that but quite frankly in most cases if we are raising energy there should be an intention for it and that intention should be something relating to how we want to change who and where and how we are in any given moment so those five things are our core things that we're going to work through when we talk uh in part two a little bit more about this so types of rituals group or individual so if you have the advantage of having a group that you circle with um wonderful you may experience rituals you might have opportunities to trade off on who's writing it individual or solitary rituals can be just as fulfilling and sometimes even more fulfilling than a group ritual because you actually are customizing it specifically for you an espot or a sabbat so we are familiar with the phases of the moon there are also um, many other uh, phases that are not the traditional dark new full moons um, actually a book review that uh, you'll read in pagan pages this month is uh, Llewellyn's little book of moon spells it's a wonderful wonderful book and um, I highly recommend that book uh, the author gives you a, a variety of different lunations that you wouldn't normally work with and sabbats the eight major holidays that are on the great wheel life events uh you know anything that is a coming of age a, a hand fasting a wickening uh funerary rites um croning sagings you name it if, if it's a life event that you wish to acknowledge write a ritual for it initiatory events depending on what your tradition does depending on perhaps what you do with self-initiation first degree second degree dedicants craft mothers craft fathers third degrees fourth degrees um, celebratory or ceremonial celebratory or 
uh, tend to be a little lighter in nature than ceremonial, which are very structured, um, you know, very precise in every action that is taken. A ritual of self-dedication, if you're beginning new work, uh, if you are dedicating yourself to a particular deity. Tool consecration, we, I've written about that uh, when I talked a little bit about using tools. I, I gave you all a, a tool consecration ritual for that. Uh, dedicating statuary that you get, uh, consecration of crystals, on and on and on. So this is just a little tidbit of what I'm gonna be writing about next month. Next month, uh, ritual and the creation of sacred space part two. I'm going to be a little bit more specific with you all about uh, and give you some examples that you can work with and, and use. If you're also reading my Peeking in the Shadows column, you can uh, use a lot of what is in the magical arts right now as far as the creation of sacred space. You can use that in your Book of Shadows if you'd like. Please feel free to tweak it, remodel it, rewrite it, do whatever you need. Um, but you can use it of a, as a, a jumping off point if you'd like. So next month for part two, we're going to talk about specifically the components of a ritual, its execution, and the how, and then also the learning curve, because there is a learning curve regardless of whether you are an adept and have been doing rituals for years, or you are someone who is new to ritual writing. There's always a learning curve based on what it is that you're hoping to accomplish with that particular ritual. So I hope you found this helpful. I hope you enjoyed doing something a little bit off the beaten path this month. And I hope you all stay well, be safe, and hopefully I'll talk to you soon and see you in another video or see you on the pages of paganpages.org. Have a wonderful and blessed evening. Bye now.